Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Sharon, and I'm a software engineer at Wolfram Research. Um, I'm the primary maintainer of the functions import and export, and a lot of the functions related to these topics. Um, today, this is a Twitch, um, one of another series of our Twitch talks where we're going to be talking about data import and export. So, before we dive right in, I just wanted to mention that this marketing page here, the language new and 12 for Wolfram Language, goes over a number of different topics that are really interesting and show all the new features in the language. In particular, you'll notice that for every single one of these topics, there is an application in data import and export, which is why import and export is so critical to the language. Before you can actually do any of the analysis that you want to, you need to import the contents and get to the data that you want. Right now, Wolfram Language already interacts with 226 formats in 12. This is a ongoing effort and we already have added 11 formats since 11.3. With these new data formats, um, you're going to see a lot of new topics in areas that we haven't even discovered in Wolfram Language before. So for example, RDF and Sparkle support is brand new to the language and the formats come with it. I also want to bring some attention to the image and audio computation pages where the formats for image and audio have become quite robust and working with them is truly a pleasure. Now, without any further ado, let's go into the data import and export page that my team has worked on. On the import and export team, we have some core goals that we want to address. So Wolfram language is a language that has, I, I would say, the most features built in directly to the language in all kinds of different fields. So whether we're talking about machine learning, doing statistical analysis, or finance, medicine, physical science, if you're looking at biological data, chemical data, it all comes with its own data format that you need to interact with. In particular, my team has looked at some formats that are very general in their purpose, like CSV, TSV, and Excel, and making sure that the functionality exists to give the users that they need to get right to the contents that they're looking for. In addition to adding new tools and upgrading our old tools, we're also working internally to build things that are scalable, like common utilities that provide the same common ground solutions for things like looking at parts of files, even though their implementations and formats are very different. So I would say that our most important goals are making sure that the mechanism for interacting with data, no matter the domain, is consistent, and that you're able to go straight to working with the data that you have interest in seeing meaning that you can go right to the part of the file, no matter how large the file is, efficiently. In addition to this, we want to ensure that that overhead of getting directly to your contents is as minimal as possible. So we also want to make sure that the data that you import is immediately computable. <clears throat> because there are so many different data formats, and we strive to add as many as that we can um, every release cycle, we hope that no matter what your workflow is for your applications, the formats will already be supported so that you have the flexibility to develop the tools how you want. Another core goal of the import-export team is to make sure that the data is reliably imported and efficiently accessed. This particular page is going to go over a few main sections. This first row, we're going to be talking about the updates that have been made to CSV and TSV and a cool application of stuff that you can do to make your data um, immediately computable, even if you only had an image of it. Then we'll talk about the HDF5 format, another very interesting format that provides a lot more power than something like CSV and a lot richer structure. Then we're also talking about a format called FITS, FITS is primarily used um, for astronomical data and is widely endorsed by NASA. And then lastly, we're just going to talk about some general topics that impact import and export in general. So let's dive right into the spreadsheet speed improvements. Uh, CSV, TSV, XLS, and XLSX have all been supported in Wolfram Language for many versions. They have 
received significant effort, both in terms of making sure that the contents are very robust, but also providing the ability to go directly to the contents of the file that you're looking for. For starters, we have taken some many thousands of elements and compared the timings between version 11 and version 12 and seeing a major improvement over two and a half times as fast in most cases um, for importing the entire XLS file. Where you're really going to see tremendous improvement is looking at the parts of the file. Now going directly to the contents is sometimes over 100 times as fast. If we look at CSV, we're also getting major improvements just looking at the entire file. So for many million elements, you can get a large number of contents imported. And again, if we're just talking about wanting to take some number of rows or columns from a CSV file, it is significantly faster. Not only are we focusing on making the basic and core implementations as robust and fast as possible, we also want to provide elements that give you the flexibility to get directly to the contents that you want without having to do too much work. So for starters, Let's take a look at some of these examples in our notebook. For CSV, the contents are very, the, the format is very simple. All it is is plain text that is separated by contents or by commas in a file. What raw data is going to give you is a very fast way to access the strings themselves. And if you look at these contents, all of the elements that you're receiving back are strings now, as opposed to data, which is going to do some interpretation and actually turn these things into numbers. New elements that are in 12 are things like the row count and the max column count that immediately allow you to see what the size of the data that you're working with is. <clears throat> While CSV is a very simple format, and does not provide any sort of structure or hierarchy of the contents, our importers and exporters are powerful enough to take contents even like this that have many nested associations. If we look at this um, data set, there are all kinds of associations in this large expression here. We're actually able to export this contents to CSV, and you'll notice that there, we're not doing anything special here. If you just ask for this content as a data set and tell it that there's one header line, we are able to get these expressions back with their original structure. Like I've mentioned several times, sometimes you're working with a data set and you only care about one particular part of it. If we were to say, one new feature in 12 is that before you could only specify the indices that you wanted as some list of integers or a specific in integer. These tabular formats where spans are very important are now supported. So if we wanted to just take the first nine rows, skipping by three, and the first four columns, the syntax is completely simple and consistent between all formats in terms of how you access their contents. And this is only going to pull in and read the data that you asked for, it's not going to do anything else. If we go back to our marketing page here, uh, th these examples were basically the ones that I just showed. Excel has a very similar update. One thing that you'll notice is that working with CSV in Excel now feels basically the exact same. Um, they both support things like data set. They both support these new features for directly getting your headers. And this makes the process of pulling in a data set that's immediately workable very quick. In addition, quality of life functions such as figuring out the dimensions of your file by each named sheet is now possible. And again, what you're going to see is that the parts of accessing an Excel file are the same as CSV. You can use spans to drill down to just the contents that you're looking for. So you could access the sheet named 1980 directly, or you can say that you want all of the sheets from the second on skipping by two. And this is the result.
this example is a lot of fun. Um, a lot of the time you are, and this is something that I've experienced myself, looking through some paper in a PDF. And unfortunately, the contents are somehow difficult to access or the table itself, if you try to copy paste, it doesn't make sense. Or it might even just be an image of a data to begin with. And we still want to actually play with the numbers and do our own analysis with it. So this is just a very small snippet of some census data that I acquired online. And right off the bat, what we want to do is take each of these uh, cells of contents and split them up so that we can recognize each of them using text recognize. So just some very simple image processing to take the pixel values of the picture, find the peaks or find these dark lines, and find the positions of them in the image. Just doing this very simple operation, and it's just two lines of code, can identify where the cells start and begin both in the x and y directions. The segmentation of the image is also very straightforward. We just image take from the coordinates that we found above. And lastly, there is minimal amounts of cleanup needed to actually get the contents perfectly imported. So I just ran this, and now these are actually text fields. I can highlight them. We could work with this data. We could export this data to any format that we want. And it was really only one tiny piece of cleanup from the image recognition. This is a really powerful tool that could be used in a wide range of applications. That is our first row here in data import and export, um, talking about spreadsheets. The next topic that we have is HDF5. Like I mentioned, we want to try to provide as many formats as possible. And for some cases, CSV just isn't going to cut it. Um, in particular, if you have a complicated data hierarchy, if you have um, contents that are of many ranks, if you have specific data types, CSV is not going to adequately itself understand the structure of this data. However, HDM HDF5 will. What HDF5, it's an acronym for hierarchical data format, and it supports all kinds of things like different groups of data sets. Those data sets can have attributes or some metadata associated with them. We can have named data types like unsigned integer eight, et cetera, and it can all be structured in a convenient way. HDF5 has become much faster like CSV and Excel have. There's a new handy raw data element that offers more speed differences and brings the contents directly as a numeric array. I think that not only is this a lot faster, I think that's also probably the data type that you want to be working with immediately because, well, you have typed vectors of data and now numeric array provides that support. We also have much faster support of the export of strings, nearly eight times faster. In addition to improving the speed and robustness, we again are doing our best to add all the elements that allow you to access the contents of the data that you're important, interested in. So starting with the summary element. The summary element gives you a high level overview of what kinds of contents you're going to find in your data set. If you go down and take a look at the structure graph, you can see immediately that this starts to look a lot more complicated than something that you're going to see in a two-dimensional spreadsheet. We have all these different data sets down here on different nodes or named data types with the actual contents of the data that are structured in a hierarchy that is specific to the contents. Using this structured graph and the structured graph legend, one can make sense of their file and directly start working with the contents that they care about in the most efficient way possible. So we have another here, the sample one, which has a data set in it called, uh, we have a bunch of integer data, and in particular, there's some unsigned integer eight data in there. We can directly and go get those contents without wasting our time looking at the rest of the file. These contents can be imported both directly as data, like they always have as list of lists of numbers, 
or as raw data in a typed numeric array that has a specific rank. And it's important to realize that when you're working with types of data that has a specific rank, HDF5 is going to be extremely efficient. If you haven't taken a look at, at this format before, I strongly suggest that you do if this sounds like your types of applications. Not only do we need to be able to read HDF5 contents, but we also need to be able to write to it. And with a format as complicated as HDF5, it's not as straightforward as just passing an element saying, well, here's my table of data. You have multiple tables of data, which need to have specific attributes, specific types. Whatever the application is, we have a simple way to describe our expressions that is well documented under the HDF5 format. The expressions themselves have names for their data sets, or we can tell whether or not we are actually working with a data set, a group, a name, data type, or an attribute by passing in a rule with the names of the elements that you wish to export. And after exporting the simple file, which has these name data types and these attributes, we can see the structure of our file. Not only can we take that file that we already had and work with it directly, but we can even add to it so that the file grows in size. We can efficiently open the file and just add the section that we needed. So now you'll notice that there's an appended data set here at this leaf node. The concept that I was just talking about of appending to a file is very powerful. Um, when you're working with data, sometimes you want to prune and find the specific things that you're looking for and then accumulate them into one master file. With the new control that we have with export elements as well as um, with just the improvements to HDF5 in general, we are now able to add to the file every individual component in its structure as we describe it. So now we, we, what we started to do here is look up at planet data. And with the planet data, we're interested in things like the semi-major access, the eccentricity, et cetera. And we can take those contents and say, in this case, we're getting Mars and Jupiter data. And you'll notice that we get from our orbit data things from Mars, from Jupiter, and we put everything together in its structure. Even though it has a complicated structure, we can still add to this using those same concepts that we have for exporting to an entire file in whatever form that we need. So in this case, we've added some information about Venus, and you can see that the structure of the file has changed. And these are, of course, my favorite examples. What can we actually do with this? Well, with HDF5, the data could be very complex, and there's a wide range of applications. One that you might not have expected would be simple financial data. In this case, we have some stock values that we just downloaded on the internet. And right off the bat, we know that there's three groups and four data sets. We take a look at the structure of this file. We see that there's this data over here and data description. We can also see what the attributes of the file are. So this comment is rather descriptive. We know that we have a data set here that contains the closing prices of 159 stocks. If we take a look at the data set under data description names, we actually see the names of all the stocks and this header here. So let's just grab the dates from the data data set. All right, now we have all of our dates, we have the names of our dates, and we have a description of what the contents in our file are. What we can now do with this is directly make a date list plot of the contents of the data sets split by the stock that we're examining. And we can even make a plot label by directly using the comment that was in the attributes of the file.
And that concludes our row about HDF5. Now we have some updates for the FITS data format. So like I mentioned a little bit before, um, FITS is a format that's used to describe largely astronomical data. Um, the kinds of contents that you can put in a FITS file would be maybe an image, a table of ASCII data, or a table of binary data. However, unlike HDF5, the dimensions of FITS data are always 2D data. You cannot store um, ranks of numeric arrays, et cetera, in the FITS data format. Right off the bat, we can start by looking at the speed improvements in FITS. Uh, the average speed up is, again, much faster for these data formats. Every time that we address these formats, we want to make sure that they're working as efficiently as possible. And we can see that we're comparing the import of a single frame file, but also a multi-frame single HDU file. So if you're not familiar with FITS, um, the HDU is basically uh, each like group of data. So when you're importing FITS contents, you're going to get back an association. Um, and the HDU is going to be the number that you're looking at on the left-hand side there. So this is talking about one HDU, but has multiple frames in that HDU for that image. So think something sort of similar to a TIFF, but a bit more complicated. And we can actually take a look at what we get back here. So let's dive right into what the new elements in FITS are. For one, we can start with those high level summaries like we were doing in HDF5 to see what contents we want to dive into. We have image and binary table in the first and second HD respectively. You can ask for things like the dimensions to see what the contents of the files start to look like before you even dive into your data. If you ask for something like image size, you'll notice that even though we're still talking about sample.fit, it's only going to return something for HDU number one. That's because this element is particular to the image. And that's where it becomes obvious why these associations and these HDU indices are so important so that you know which contents are going to be returned when you're talking about specific two images. Similarly, table headers is only talking about the tables of data in a FITS file. And we get back the second HDU, the headers for that content. Another element that you're seeing more um, that was added to things like CSV, HDF5, and now FITS is raw data. And as much as possible, we're giving you directly the numeric array of the rank of the content. Driving the point home how important it is to access the contents directly and not import the entire file, we can drill down to just the first HDU by index. You can also drill into the first HDU take the first image and grab these rows of pixels for the image. That gives you a numeric array of image pixel data that you can then call image on. And like it mentioned, and I have several times before, not loading all the data in memory is critical in saving memory and time. And to do a simple comparison, accessing the parts of the file's image as opposed to importing all of it and then just taking the part is not only faster, but it also consumes significantly less memory. Next, we can talk about doing some analysis on particularly the table data in a FITS file. Like I mentioned, there could be image and table data stored in a FITS file. This particular page talks about what you could do with the table data. So let's take a look at that sample.fits that we've been looking at. Go straight to the second HDU and get its table data. And now we're going to pull out something specific, like the general information of the table data. You can see information about how the values are stored in the file, and you can find units for the contents in your file. The example goes on to take those units and actually construct quantities in Wolfram language for the final results. You can even combine the data with the original image data and put together a nice data set that has typed quantities, images, 
and all the contents of your file in a nice, easy to display format. For fits, we want to show how easy it is to use these simple features like accessing meta information, looking for specific keys, and how quickly this could be used to build a comprehensive application. So to start, let's take a look at what the general information is under meta information. We can get the author from this. We can also get the creation date from this. We could also inspect the dimensionality of the data stored in the file. Now, using these simple fields that we can query is all we need to write simple queries like, does this file have an image? Does this file um, have an author that matches some particular string? And we can build a simple check using what is essentially a line and a half of code here. And with this simple check, we can check a single file and see if it matches those contents. This image shows an example of the type of application that you could build with this. Because prototyping and <coughs> uh, building front-end applications in Wolfram Language is so simple, all you need to know is how to make a simple text box, a simple panel, and arrange these things in a grid, and now you have full control over building an application that's tailored to your business, your application that provides your needs directly. If you're finding that you wish that you could make some modification to an existing program, you could basically build one on the ground up in just a couple of hours. And as you can see, as he types in different information, it goes through and provides a convenient interface focusing in only on the data that he cares about. This next element is pretty straightforward, but is important nonetheless. Import file summaries are, uh, it's a summary element that should be used for multiple data formats. Right now we have many file formats that are most important implemented. We plan to add this for even more formats. But simply asking for a summary of something like a CSV data is going to give you high level descriptions like how many rows and columns are there. HDF5 told you things like its data sets. JPEG here tells you things like its image size, its color space, the kinds of information that you want to know right off the bat before you start working with your data. Another neat feature that's been added in export is controlling the overwrite behavior. Overwrite target is an option that's been implemented in many functions, but now is also supported by export. By default, Exporting to a file over overwrote the contents. If you want control in your application to make sure that you're not overwriting your files, simply add this option and your file will be safe. Similar to many operating systems, we wanted the ability to automatically choose a suitable name depending on if your file already exists. So say that we've already exported to test.txt. If the file already exists using overwrite target of keep both, we'll simply append a two to the file name. Some file formats, in particular HDF5 and FIT so far, also support overwrite target goes to append, which allows adding data to an existing file. So here we have a FITS file that has one image in its first HDU, export with overwrite target append, and then we have a second HDU with another image. While being able to import and export between formats is incredibly useful, sometimes you need to convert between file formats for your application. We've introduced a new function in version 12 called file convert, which does exactly this. With a convenient syntax, you can specify the input of a file in a rule, and the right-hand side will be used to infer the format of the file. So in this case, if you want to change a WAV file to an MP3, much like you could just call export to a .mp3, file convert is going to recognize that the format here is MP3. And as you can see, by converting from WAV to MP3, we have a much smaller file size. You could do the same thing with something like TIFF and JPEG.
When we use JPEG compression, we do save file size, but at the cost of compression artifacts. And to illustrate what kinds of differences and what kind of artifacts you might see in your image, we did the image difference here. So you can see that the background was translated well, but there are some artifacts in the spiky logo. File convert could also be extended to be used with functions like file system map to uh, directly work with an entire directory of files and perform some operation converting an entire group of files to another folder. So say you want to take all of your PNG images in some directory and convert all of them to JPEG. This is trivial to do in just a couple short lines of code. We have one last topic, and it is import and export of byte array. Um, with the introduction of numeric array and byte array in recent versions and its extended use, we want to be able to directly import and export from byte arrays. So let's go ahead and play with some of these examples. We can read a byte array of the contents exactly as it exists on the file system from this flowers.webp example. You'll notice that it's about 292.4 kilobytes. And if we look at the size of the file, these are practically identical. The byte array is efficiently storing in memory these contents directly. Here we have a base64 string. Base encode of a byte array will give you back the base64 version of the string. And to kind of illustrate how these functions fit into the rest of the import export ecosystem, we can compare this to import string. If you call import string on a base encoded um, content and give it the format of base64, it's going to recognize and decode this. By the same virtue, if we didn't encode that byte array as base64, but just converted it to a raw byte string by using byte array2 string, we can still import string these contents the same way that you worked with import string in the past. The difference is now you can work directly with the byte array using the function import byte array. And of course, since we're going to be supporting import byte array, you need to be able to detect the format, much like file format. So we've added byte array format. Lastly, if what you want is in memory to be working with a byte array, you can take your expressions and export them directly to a byte array. And that concludes our marketing page examples. Um, we have been making a strong effort to be as active as possible within the community. If there are formats that you are interested in, please drop a note about them in the chat. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are on formats that you think that we need to add to the system. We'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of what's been working well and the features that you're really excited about. If you aren't catching us here today, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the Wolfram community or Mathematica Stack Exchange, where my team will very directly um, interact and see what we can do to make the language as powerful as possible and satisfy all of our needs. And with that, thank you, everybody. <laughs>